Welcome everybody to Life Skills for Graduating Seniors brought to you by Career Services. Uh, we have a couple of our lovely Cal Maritime folks here to share their expertise with you. Well, thank you, Leora. Um, I just want to preface this by saying I'm not a certified public accountant or I'm not a certified financial planner. So the uh, information that will be provided today is just um, uh, suggestions, not uh, things that you should do. Um, but these are things that I've uh, come across in my um, short time after graduating from Cal Maritime. Uh, as Leora said, this is all about money, um, this first section here. So without further ado, um, so what happens when uh, you make um, make your uh, money at Cal Maritime? You're gonna wanna figure out what you're gonna wanna do. Um, and again, the grass is not always greener on the other side. And what that means in a nutshell is if you get a great job out of Cal Maritime when you first leave and you're talking with all your other friends, uh, their company they're working with might not be the right fit for you. Um, so just don't jump job to job, assuming that it's gonna be a better job uh, and a better position for you. Uh, so areas that you wanna look at um, and work with a certified financial planner for the future is um, where to put your money, make your money work for you. So whether it's a 401k, which is a retirement account, a Roth IRA, which is an individual uh, retirement account, the stock market, property, et cetera. Another one we should add now is um, digital currencies because uh, as technology goes, so will digital currency. Um, but key points on the 401k is that uh, you can max uh, donate 19,500 per year. Uh, and one thing that you wanna look out for is if your employer says the words match 401k. So if they'll match whatever you input into your 401, that's a plus. Uh, with the Roth IRA right now, the max per year that you can donate is $6,000, which is $500 um, per month, but don't be discouraged. You can do any amount. So if you only have $100 left after you pay all your bills and things like that every month, you can put that into a Roth IRA and it will grow over time. The thing that they say is that after 20, uh, after 40 years of investing um, money in your Roth, you're going to have around a million, million two, million four, depending on how the market does. And then obviously the stock market is not another option for you. Uh, but issues with the stock market is it's risky um, and you're not always going to make money. So I know you've been seeing things on GameStop and things like that. That's not normal. Um, it's a riskier investment. So you need to be very, very careful and make sure you talk with the um, certified financial planner with those type of investments. And lastly, with property, um, it's a long-term investment or it can be a short-term investment. Depends on what you want to do with the items that you invest in. Uh, you always want to make sure that you shop around. Um, there's many companies out there that do this for their living. Uh, they're going to work for you, for you, for you to invest their money with them. It's a trust thing. So if you don't get a good feeling on the phone with them, don't go with them. Call another company. And you can utilize these companies um, against each other and say, oh, I went to Fidelity or I went to TD Ameritrade. Um, those are just a couple as an example. One recommendation I would have, though, when you first graduate, don't buy a new truck or car. It's a terrible investment. It's going to lose money the moment you drive it off the lot. If you can, go to a company like CarMax and look at the used lot and invest in something that will get you to A and point B. So if that's from your um, house or if that's uh, your uh, apartment to work, that's what you want to look for. And then lastly, this is important. Make sure you pay your taxes. No matter how much money you're going to make, you're still going to have to pay taxes on that money. So... If you do big purchases, if you buy a property, if you buy um, large investments and things like that, you wanna make sure that you uh, work with a certified public accountant to ensure that you are not missing any taxes because the tax man will always come back and find you. No matter how many years out it is, they'll figure out what you didn't claim. Um, so those are my tidbits. Again, I'm not a certified public accountant or certified financial planner. Um, there are professionals out there. You just need to shop around and make sure that you find the one that you can work with and you trust. And that is um, my short and sweet brief.
All right. Um, so the purpose of my presentation today is um, to help you to decide when and, and how to negotiate a job offer. Um, first thing, um, salary is not the only negotiable item. Anything on this slide is negotiable. Um, job titles are important because they allow other people outside the organization to understand what you do. If you've ever been saddled with a bad job title, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. So it's, it's really a, a, a very important um, item. Start date. Whoops. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, start date uh, might be an important if you have obligations. Vacation, PTO, do you want to maximize your time off? Do you, do you really want to have an extra week of vacation? Um, there could be uh, important, um, uh, it might be important to you strategically who you're going to report to. So you may want to um, negotiate your reporting relationship. Will you have a budget? Um, how big is the budget? What kind of a budget is it? Access to resources can be very important. Are they asking you to move? Um, moving and travel expenses can be a real important item. Professional memberships and subscriptions, also important. Um, do they have a bonus plan? What's the criteria for the, to get the bonus? What, what uh, amount of bonus might it be? Will you be working on commissions? Um, what percentage um, um, of you know, the sale will you be receiving? If they don't budge on salary, maybe they'll give you a signing bonus. So those are all factors. If they're asking you to work from home, home office technology can be real expensive. So that can be a factor for you. Are they asking you to travel for your job? So if so, then a car um, or at least mileage expenses can be very um, essential. Schedule flexibility. Now this would be like, um, the ability to come in late or maybe to leave early or work a 410 or maybe have every other Friday off. Professional development, that can be anything from, um, you know, sending you to um, workshops, training opportunities. Um, this is them putting money in the budget for you, for your training. Um, maybe it would be reimbursing you for professional certifications or even tuition reimbursement if you want to go back and get a degree. Maybe you like working from home. Um, they may not be willing to let you work from home all the time, but maybe one day a week. Stock, stock options might be another way kind of in the long run to, to, to earn more money. And lastly, um, if they ask you to work under a contract, make sure you look at um, what is the duration of the contract? Is it one year or two years? Do they have standards of performance pinned into that contract that you have to meet? All of that might be negotiable as well. Real important to prepare, not only before the interview, but actually even before you um, start completing applications because one of the um, questions on the application is your minimum salary requirement. So you're going to want to know, know that in your head before you're even starting out. What are ways to find out um, salaries for your profession? You can go out and uh, do research. Two of my favorite um, places to, um, whoops, how that happen? Two of my favorite places to do research are um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's www.bls.gov or um, glassdoor.com. Um, so say you've been invited to interview. Um, one thing you're gonna wanna do before your interview 
is research the organization's benefits and their work culture. Um, so you can go on their website and poke around. Um, another thing you can do is see if you can um, hook up with anybody who's worked there before. Maybe they'll give you the lowdown. If you don't know anybody, maybe you can go on, on uh, social media. Um, you can go on LinkedIn, I know that. And um, you can, you can um, try to pe find people who work for the organization and message them and maybe they'll give you some information. Lastly, once you're armed with all of this um, information about the organization's benefit and culture, then you can, you can sit down and prioritize what your list of negotiable items are. Congratulations, you got a job offer. So this may sound really basic, like basic stuff, but you really need to act enthusiastic. Why? Because the person on the other end of the phone is not going to want to work for you if they don't sense that you um, have some enthusiasm and really want to work for them. So um, do that. And then also the next thing to do is try and buy yourself some time. There's actually three steps to this. You tell them, thank you. I'm really excited um, about the opportunity to work for your team. Um, number two is, but I want to go over the offer in detail. Can you give me some time to do this? I would ask for no more than about three to four days. Um, and then lastly, um, try and get a, um, something in writing, get the offer in writing. So you'll have something to review. So now it's go time. You're, you're ready to make your counter offer. Um, so you're never going to want to go into um, a, a negotiation of any type without having your reasons um, there to back you up. There's three types of justifying reasons. There's equity-based. That's, that's, um, that's about you. That is, what, are you, what do you have to offer that organization? Be it your skills, your specialized skills, your um, education or um, your years of experience. Um, Quality-based is what people are earning in the market for, the, uh, for that particular profession. So whatever the marketplace dictates. And then needs-based, um, this is my least favorite, but you have to be careful. You don't wanna sound petty, um, but needs-based, um, for example, a good reason of, 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 of the need is say they are asking you to move someplace expensive and you know that the cost of living, um, you know, where you're asked to move is a lot more than what, you know, what you, you um, where you normally live. So that would be a good, good reason to, to ask for something based on need. So lastly, you're going to want to consider their whole deal. Uh, and really listen closely to everything that they say to you. They may have some hard no's, and um, usually those come up because they have a budget or they have um, salary caps, or maybe they, have, they, they don't have any flexibility at all with their benefits. You're gonna wanna focus on that entire deal. Um, with large organizations, they may be hiring 20 people. Um, so they may not have any flexibility at all on salary, um, but they might be able to have some flexibility um, on other of your items. Um, on, the, on the contrast, if you're trying to get a job at a small organization, they may be able to um, have some flexibility on salary, but because they have you know, very fixed benefits, they may not be able to do anything else for you. Where does this job fit in the grand scheme of things for you. You've looked at all of the perks and all of the uh, benefits. Um, are you gonna be happy at this job? Where does, it, where does it position you in your career path? And lastly, you know, be, be prepared to walk away. If it's not everything that you want it to be, just be prepared to walk away.
thank you for your attention. And I think the next person is Kristen Batista with benefits. All right, so I'm gonna be talking today about employer benefits, um, health insurance, retirement savings plans, and other benefits that your um, employers may be offering. So employers offer a variety of benefits to eligible employees, and the value of these benefits can be about 30% of your total compensation. So a way to think about that is if you're gonna be paid being paid $50,000 a year. The value of your benefit package will be about $15,000. And you can kind of look at your entire compensation package, about $65,000. And that's something to keep in mind um, when you're comparing and looking around at different jobs, um, with different employers. And it's important to make your health benefit choices thoughtfully because you won't be able to change your benefit selection until the next open enrollment period, unless you have a major life change, such as loss of other coverage, um, maybe you're not eligible to be on your parents' benefits um, any longer, um, or you get married, or you welcome a new baby. So whenever you have one of these major life changes, you'll want to communicate this with your human resources department so that your um, enrollment window gets opened because of your life change. Um, you'll, you might have 30 or 60 days um, to make um, enrollment changes because of your life change. And you also wanna learn what time frame you have um, with your employer to enroll in benefits and when they become effective. So again, typically you have 60 days from your date of hire or your eligibility date to enroll and your benefits would become effective the first of the month following. So we talk about medical insurance. So companies offer different levels of medical coverage. Um, some employers might only offer one, but they um, some may offer multiple levels. So choosing the right plan is going to be something that just depends on your situation. It's, it's an individual um, factor here. So it might depend on your ongoing need for doctor's visits or prescriptions how many num um, family members you're gonna be covering under your plan, whether a specific doctor you like is in your health network and how much your out-of-pocket costs could be. Some companies cover the total cost of your health insurance premium, but most likely you'll have to cover some of it yourself. A premium is, the on is only a portion of your expenses. You'll also wanna be aware of co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles, and out-of-pocket limits. You also may have the option to choose between a health maintenance organization or an HMO and a preferred provider organization or a PPO. An HMO allows you to go to specific doctors that are contracted within your insurance company, and a PPO will give you more flexibility in choosing a doctor, but you may have more out-of-pocket expenses. Now I'm going to touch on some of the terminology I mentioned on the last slide. Um, a premium, it's a yearly fee that you pay for your health insurance coverage. This will look like a deduction from your paycheck, and you're typically only paying a percentage of the full premium to the health insurance company, and your employer is covering the rest, and often your employer's portion is going to be about three or four times what you're paying. A deductible is the total amount that you will have to pay to cover your health care costs before the insurance company starts paying. So your deductible will most likely be expressed as an annual amount. And this amount varies between insurance coverage. And you may have insurance coverage that doesn't have a deductible. A co-payment is a set fee that you pay to an in-network health care provider at the time of service. And the remaining um, cost of the service will be picked up by your insurance company. This is for services like doctor's visits, prescriptions, tests, x-rays, or hospital visits. And they each have their own set co-payment amount. 
Coinsurance is the percentage of your healthcare payment that you will pay after your deductible has been met, or it's the percentage that you'll pay if you get out of network healthcare. Your company will pick up the rest and typically it's a 20-80 split. There may be a health plan that's a 90-10 split, but you'll pay the 20% and then they'll pay the 80%. Out of pocket limit is the most that you'll have to pay for covered services in a plan year. So after you spend this amount on deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance for in-network care, your health plan is gonna pay 100% of the costs for covered benefits. And then lastly, I'm gonna point out um, uh, one document that's quite important when you're looking at um, picking your health plan. So the summary of benefit and coverage, um, it'll explain what the plan covers and what your looking to pay for covered services. Here is a um, snapshot of one page from a summary of benefits and coverage for a Kaiser Health Plan. Um, in this here you see, it gives you specifically what you will pay your co-payment for seeing a doctor in the office or clinic, what you pay or what you won't pay in this case, no charge, you have a test, and what you'll pay for prescriptions, um, depending on if it's a generic or a preferred brand name, and if you're getting that retail or open um, mail order. Um, one thing about the summary of benefits is, which really helpful, is that this is a uniform kind of a glossary. So every health plan, whether it be Kaiser or Blue Shield, their summary is going to look similar and identical. The amounts may change, your deductible might change, um, but the look and feel of this document um, is uniform. And it's important, it's a 10 page document. So when you're looking at multiple health plans, I think this is a good tool to use. The dental and vision, um, they each typically come with their own separate policies and unique terms and conditions. You might not have as much free range with selecting a dentist or an optometrist, um, and some employers may not even offer dental or vision insurance. Um, it's good to note here, though, that in your health plan, you'll typically be able to see an ophthalmologist or an eye health specialist. Um, you can have them write your annual class or contact lens prescription and just have a general eye exam. Um, so with dental, uh, dental insurance, you'll, you may get the option to choose between a PPO and an HMO. Your dental insurance will cover preventative care like semi-annual teeth cleanings or x-rays. may also cover portions of bigger procedures such as root canals, braces, or crowns. And with vision, um, what I've found is that only about 60% of employers offer vision insurance. So if it is offered, you might only get one option and it's normally not expensive and it's really the primary purpose is to cover routine or preventative eye exams and then maybe a portion of the cost of contact lenses or glasses. You'll wanna read the details of the plan carefully because most vision plans will only cover up to a specific dollar amount on contacts or glasses and then it's usually one or the other every other year. Retirement savings plans is something that your employer may offer to you. Um, they may offer a 401k or a 403b plan. Um, these both provide tax advantage way to save for retirement. Your employer may also offer a match. An example of a, of a typical match is 50% up to 6% of your salary. So if you make $100,000 and contribute $6,000 a year to your 401k, your company would match you $3,000. So you wanna to get to know the investment options that are available in your company's plan or plans. Um, a pension is a retirement account that your company maintains until you retire. You'll typically put in a portion or percentage of um, your compensation towards the pension and then your employer will put in a much larger amount. Um, and then once you retire, you will receive a designated amount each month as a payout. 
Um, and this is known as a defined benefit plan. And then lastly, I'm just gonna to touch on some of the additional benefits that your employer could offer. Um, paid time off is a benefit. Um, vacation, personal, and sick time. Um, you'll want to know if your company's PTO policy is use it or lose it, um, in which case you'll wanna use it um, that year, or if you can roll over in a certain number of hours to the following year, um, and you'll also wanna look out for maximum accruals. Um, so you'll stop earning your vacation of sick leave. You don't want to get there. Um, you'll want to use that and then continue accruing your hours. Some employers also offer a payout if you leave. So if you separate from employment, um, they may pay out your vacation or if your um, all your leave time is lumped into one PTO um, bucket, they may pay you out on your, PTO, um, your accrued PTO balance. Um, paid holidays are benefit, pre-tax health savings account, life insurance, disability insurance, leave of absences for income or job protection, wellness benefits, commuter benefits, and educational benefits such as tuition assistance or student debt repayment. Um, to the bottom line here, just carefully review your employer's benefit package reevaluate them if life circumstances change or during open enrollment, it's always good to revisit, take a look at what those benefit options are. And then lastly, just always talk with your resources department. They're helpful. Thank you. Hi, okay. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about finding the uh, credit cards credit scores, and identity theft. If you can go ahead, yeah, thanks. So the purpose of credit cards is basically instantaneous cash to be able to walk into a store, buy what you want. But I hope that you look at the other three categories, which are far more important for the purpose of credit cards. And that is to take care of emergency situations Say you've got to buy uh, new tires or you're stuck someplace and you've got to fly home for an, for an emergency. Um, the, the third reason would be to build credit. If you want to get the best rates on loans, get approved for loans and get the best interest rates on loans, you need to build up credit in order to um, pose yourself as a good consumer to your bank. Using credit cards is one of the best ways of doing that. Um, the other thing is if you are very vigilant and you are very disciplined, using it for day-to-day -day purchases can also provide a lot of rewards for you. Uh, you know, travel dollars, uh, airline deals, things like that. So uh, as long as you pay off your debt every single month, using it for day-to-day -day purchases can be good, but it does require a lot of discipline and also making sure that you check your balances frequently to make sure that no one else has, has used your credit card. Now there are debit cards, which are what we also call check cards, but you're mostly familiar with debit. And that is a, line um, that is the credit card it looks it's the same purpose as a credit card but it is tied directly to your checking account or your savings account um, it prevents you from going into debt because you can only use what is available in that account you can withdraw money from an atm and not um, incur charges as you would with a credit card using that in, as as a uh, to get to take out cash and usually you're going to have daily purchase limits the easy thing about that is say you have to buy those tires and they are about you know three or four hundred dollars more than your daily limit. It is very easy to call your bank and tell them you're making a larger purchase and you want them to extend your daily limit. They'll be glad to do that. That is not unusual. If you have the money in your account, they're more than happy to help you with that. The other thing about a debit card is it is not reported on uh, credit report companies. So that's the downside to it is, although you may be making purchases every day and taking care of your bank account, you're not going into overdraft, that 
that good reward and that good behavior is not reported on your credit report. So let's talk about the interest rates for credit cards. Um, basically, you have a uh, interest rate and it is called a annual percentage rate. Most credit cards will have a grace period. So um, it gives you an ability to pay off your balance in full. But if you extend beyond that grace period, you're going to be charged interest on the remaining balance. There are two types of credit card interest rates. One is a fixed and the other is a variable. Uh, fixed can uh, only change, well, basically negotiating with the credit card company. You can negotiate if you've got a higher salary, um, you see that your, your credit score has improved drastically, you can call your bank and actually negotiate a fixed rate. Variable rates will be try, are tied to a different kind of interest rate and it will go up and down as the index rate changes. Now, I'm not gonna go over these, but I just want you to see that there are lots of fees that are tied to credit cards because, well, the banks wanna make money off of you. So um, just so you know, you go ahead to the next page and you can see all the different kinds of fees. Make sure when you sign up with a credit card that you know what these fees are so that you can be aware of them and avoid them. A lot of them are based on using your credit card outside of the basic parameters of the credit card company. Go to the next one. Now, credit cards are, as I said, reported onto credit scores. There are lots of companies out there that have that will monitor your credit and your usage of your credit. Um, you get, you also can qualify, you will qualify for a credit score, which is tied to that. And I'll go into that just a little bit later. But basically, when you want to apply for a credit card or a loan or a mortgage or a business loan, the bank is going to look at your credit scores and your credit reports. So they want to see that you've established credit, that you uh, make payments on time uh, for two or more years, you have a good income. They also want to look at your income to debt ratio. And lastly, they're going to look at this credit score. It's called a FICO. It, company a long time ago called Fair Isaac's company created a three digit score that made it easier rather than your lender uh, or your banker having to go through your credit report and decipher if you were a good risk for a loan. They use a FICO score as a quick and easy way to determine whether they will give you a credit card and or a loan and what the interest rate will be on that loan. Um, and as I said, a credit card score is a three digit number going as low as 300 and as high as 850. And as I said, lenders will use this to determine if you qualify. Just to give you an idea, and it does vary, every credit card reporting company actually has its own credit score now. They have capitalized on that. Uh, and as I said, the range is from 300 to 850. To give you an idea, excellent credit would be maybe 780 to 850. Good credit would be maybe 660 to 780. Fair credit, 600 to maybe 660. Anything below that, you would be considered more of a financial risk to a lender or a banker. So who maintains your credit score? As I said, there are lots of credit uh, reporting companies out there, but there are three large ones, Equifax, TransUsion, and Experian. They are the largest ones. And all of your information, including your social security number, date of birth, your names, if you have any um, also known as or aliases, um, where you have lived, and every single line of credit that you have is managed on these through these companies. So they will have everything, including mortgages, your student loan debt, most importantly, will also be on there. Now, just so you know, the, these credit reporting companies will keep any negative report. And that means if you made late payments 30 days or more, or you have a, um, a judgment, court judgment, or a bankruptcy, or a lien against your property or business, those negative scores will stay on your credit report and affect your credit score for seven years. If you declare chapter seven 
or 11 in bankruptcies, those will actually stay on your credit report and score for 10 years. So you need to understand that this has an impact, but here's where I wanna stop and say something very important. We have been through a great recession of 2008 and we have now, we are in the midst of the COVID recession. This has affected families and individuals in untold ways. Um, the greatest of course being loss of life, but loss of income, loss of businesses, loss of houses, being evicted from your uh, apartment for non-payment. Things that may not be within your control. Illnesses that are not covered insurance. You may have racked up a lot of hospital bills or something. There are many things that are not within your control. So the most important thing I want you to walk away from is that your credit report and your credit score do not define who you are as a person. It is simply is recording what has happened in your financial um, experiences and in and how you have managed that. So as I said, this is information that will stay on these reports for up to seven years, but life does go on and you can repair credits. You can make sure that you're making payments on time. Uh, you can write letters of explanation to these uh, credit reporting agencies as well. Next slide. And again, this is the phone number of the three largest companies, uh, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, Transfusion. These are their 800 numbers. Of course, you can look for them online for information. And I always recommend getting a credit report and looking at it at least every year. You can also um, uh, subscribe to credit companies that will monitor your credit reports for you and notify you if new accounts have been opened up in your name or if negative um, there are negative marks on your credit scores or credit report, they will also notify you of that. They will also give you good information. Oh, you only have one credit card. Well, you could increase your credit FICO score by having maybe two credit cards. Um, so they will also give you good advice in that regard. Next slide. As I said, how long, okay, thank, thank you. We already did that one. We'll go to the next one. Um, so what can go wrong with your credit score and credit report? Well, this is the big thing. John Leibowitz, uh, who was the former chair of the Federal Trade Commission, said that one out of five Americans have an error on their credit report and one out of 10 has an error on their credit report that may lower their score. And there are lots of reasons that this can happen that have absolutely nothing to do with you. As simple as a misspelled name, wrong address, that one happened to me one time, uh, wrong birth date, incorrect social security number, um, out of date or incorrect employment history, and yes, even reporting you as deceased when you aren't, that can happen. Next slide. How do they happen? Of course, the biggest thing is human error, but also identity theft is the next biggest problem. Uh, where people go in and set up accounts under your name and misuse your credit. Um, just basic confusion, uh, misspelling or a, a difference in, in name, Johnston versus Johnson. Um, or if you yourself could uh, fill out an application and use a nickname or a shortened version of your name rather than your full legal name that's on your social security number. So there are many ways that errors can happen. As I said, the best thing to manage your credit score is to watch your credit card balances, pay them off every month, or if you had a major purchase, make sure you have a plan to pay them off within two to three months so that that interest does not accrue on the remaining balance. Um, eliminate the credit card balances, pay them off, um, pay your bills, because you can also set up your utilities on your credit report, which can be very helpful if you are using a uh, automatic debt every month to pay off. That's a great way of also establishing good credit. Use caution when closing accounts. There should be some very rare occasions where you might have to if they you are paying a high interest rate and they will not negotiate for a better rate. Um, that might be a circumstance, but typically you want to keep your credits out there. If it's a credit card you simply just don't use, you can reduce the balance, um, the balance limit on that credit card. So say you have a credit card that's very old and has been with you a number of years, but you have a credit limit of 10,000, you can lower that credit limit down to 3,000 and that will help improve your score. 
um, and only apply for credit accounts if you need them. I always say stay away from retail credit cards, gas cards, things like that. I think they're totally unnecessary. Uh, my personal view is one debit card and two credit cards are all you should need. Um, if you do get into trouble and you do walk away with a lot of debt, I just wanna let you know there are consumer credit um, protection services that will work with you on reestablishing your credit if you have gotten in over your head for one reason or another. The last thing I wanna talk about is identity theft. As I said, it's one of the largest crimes. It affects everybody. Um, I have seen students who have, um, where parents have stolen their, their social security number and date of birth and opened up credit cards on them or roommates will steal their information. But also typically it's going to be thieves who are working on a larger scale where they're getting into databases and stealing your bank information, opening up credit cards, um, using your health insurance. So you need to be vigilant at all times. Check on your bank accounts regularly to make sure your debit card is not being used by somebody, um, the information stolen. Also, like I said, run credit reports at least once a year, or especially before you're going to make a major purchase, get a copy of your credit report. Make sure all the information is up to date and correct before you walk in and purchase um, a new car or a car um, or go for a mortgage or a business loan. Next, next slide. Um, as I said, the best way to prevent that, order your credit report, know how to spot phishing, don't reuse passwords, really use some ingenuity when it comes to passwords, um, change them often, you know, every six months if possible. You can also use, there are lots of apps out there that will um, house your, your uh, passwords and you have a series of passwords you use to get into that vault. Uh, one example is a company called Keeper that uh, that's a good idea to protect your passwords um, or they can generate um, passwords for you if you want to use that and never put any of your private information out on any social media um, don't play the games where oh list you know take your name and and list all of the this information it sounds like it's interesting and a fun game but they're actually scammers out there trying to pull out what would be possible passwords based on your name and date of birth so that's something to be cautious of too. Next slide. Uh, as I said, limit your credit cards. On the back of your credit card, and although most people uh, use their little, um, the digital chip in it, um, on the back of your credit card, I would say, please write and ask for ID instead of signing your, your name. Um, about, I would say 10 to 15% of the vendors when I use my credit card actually will ask to see my driver's license. And I thank them because I want to make sure that they're checking on that. As I said, review your statements for your bank, make sure there are no unusual charges. If it's something you don't recognize, call your bank. They will go through it with you. They have a security system to do that. Uh, take the time to set up extra security, you know, uh, double authorizations, really important. And if you're not using your credit cards, your physical credit cards for any reason, but because they've been around for a long time, store them in a safe or put them in a very, very secure place. Um, or you can even destroy them. Um, you still have the credit account and it's very easy for a bank to reissue that card. It usually takes 24 hours or less. Um, again, social, make sure you secure your social security number. Don't respond to unsolicited requests, uh, especially a lot of email, you know, phishing accounts. Watch out for people looking over your shoulder if you're using your cell phone or you happen to be at a cyber cafe. Um, and when it does happen, if it does happen, the first thing to do, cancel your cards immediately, all of your cards. Notify the credit bureaus, the three credit bureaus that I'd mentioned earlier and file a police report. It is really important that will help you to regain any uh, losses that you incur. And make sure you document your conversations with your bank and um, get that information, like I said, from the police. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, thank you everybody for, for watching. Um, thank you to our panelists and hopefully you have found some, some useful information in this wealth of knowledge.